verse 16, we start to get some trouble, though, uh, in, in uh, Philippi. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune-telling. She followed Paul and us, crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. It's kind of ironic that you have uh, this woman who is is really possessed by a spirit. She has more clear thinking uh, than a lot of the Jewish authorities that, you know, are in, in these places. But and that goes back to the Gospels, too. It, it's she's, she's really on a different plane of awareness when it comes to the spirit world than, than they are. And again, this, this, the spirit within her understands immediately what's going on here. Now, it's interesting. These men are the servants of the Most High God. Draw your attention to Most High. Why is that term significant here? Okay, they're in a, I'll give you a clue. They're in a Gentile city. Okay, they've been you know, directed to go there by the Lord. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. His ministry is about reclaiming the nations. Why is the term Most High important? Because of Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32, 8. When the Most High divided up the nations. He divided them up according to the number of the sons of God. Okay, but Israel is Yahweh's portion. Jacob is his inheritance. It's this this terminology, again, most high, doesn't occur that often in the New Testament. Uh, and typically when it does... It, you know, it referred, this is an Old Testament title for the God of Israel, most high. It's a statement of authority and superiority. Uh, and again, if we take the whole Old Testament in consideration, uniqueness of Yahweh of Israel, he is you know, like no other and no other are like him. Okay, he is the most high. He's the one who disinherited the nations. He is the one who has authority over the gods of those nations. Again, all this, again, Deuteronomy 32 worldview theology packed into a title, most high. And, and, and the spirit uses this terminology of these guys who are coming in into hostile turf that is under the dominion of other spirit beings and says, hey, these guys are with the most high God. <laughs> again, it, it, it's, it's a clear declaration of really what, just in one sentence, what's actually going on. Because they are there to displace and to, you know, to disrupt, to displace, uh, to reclaim, again, th- this whole cosmic geographical mindset. Uh, the nations, you know, for the true God and for the kingdom, for this thing we call the church, the circumcision neutral people of God. Uh, that's why they're there. And again, that statement just telegraphs it uh, to, to readers, again, who would have just been familiar, that they would have seen that name and it, all these things would have clicked in their head. So these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she kept doing for many days, Paul having become greatly annoyed. <laughs> turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. Of course, we know the rest of the story. The owners of the girl and the slave girl get mad because, hey, our, you know, we just saw our income disappear because this person can't do what she was doing before. Again, because the spirit is gone. Of course, Paul and Silas end up getting thrown into prison. What I want to camp on a little bit here is this this terminology uh, where the ESV has, they met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. Literally, uh, the Greek text has a, a girl having a python spirit or a python as spirit. Okay? The Greek is pneuma pythona. Now this it sounds really weird because we associate the term python uh, with, you know, a big, you know, snake. Well, Python is a reference, again, in the ancient world to a, to a deity figure, to a specific divinity, and specifically one that, that had oracular power. Again, that's where you get this idea of, as, that, that Luke wrote about in Acts 16.16 16, about fortune-telling. Uh, Python was a, a, a divinity, again, a specific divine being, who was sort of conceived of as a snake or a dragon and typically associated with Delphi, uh, which was originally known as Pythia. Uh, so again, that, that's, that's actually where the, the terminology you know, has a more direct association there. But again, the, think of Delphi, what do you think of? The Delphic Oracle. Okay, the, and the, the Delphic Oracle wasn't the only oracle associated with Delphi or that region, uh, but you get this specific terminology that, again, people who were reading this in Greek uh, reading their New Testament back in the ancient world, they, they would have known right away, Numa Pythona is one of these 
entities, one of these divine beings, again, the spirit of divination. Now, in Greek mythology, this spirit was defeated and slain by Apollo. Again, it, uh, it was, again, well known. This wasn't sort of a peripheral character. This was sort of a significant uh, entity. Uh, priestesses at Delphi, for instance, were called Puthii. Again, they were sort of servants uh, under Python, this Python spirit, spirit of divination, uh, specifically associated with women. Again, not surprisingly here, we have a, a slave girl who is possessed, again, un under the influence of the spirit of divination, uh, the spirit of Python, as Luke describes uh, in Acts. Now, some scholars think, and there's actually a division of opinion here, some scholars think that what's going on here is ventriloquism, because there are ancient texts that associate that, that the term, that the Python spirit, with ventriloquism. It's, it's more than that here because Paul specifically addresses the spirit, and Luke tells us that the girl had a spirit of divination. So we're, it's not that just that she's a ventriloquist, okay? But I'm just telling you that there is that association in, in a few ancient texts with this. But it's kind of a misnomer because ventriloquism more broadly was thought of in the ancient world as, as to be evidence of possession, uh, some demonic possession or, again, spirit possession by a divine being, whatnot. But again, we get the contextual clues in Acts 16, especially when Paul addresses the Spirit and says, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it does, that we're, we're, we're not just dealing with a circus act here or someone who's a clever performer. This was real. So again, there's you, you get both sort of descriptions in antiquity, direct possession, then people sort of trying to fake it. The, the account here in Acts 16 makes pretty clear she wasn't faking it. Okay, she was under the, the authority, under the power of this spirit. And of course, she's the one saying, hey, these guys are servants of the Most High God. Uh, again, very, very clear you know, spiritual understanding on spiritual terms of what is going on here. So again, I, th I think that's something that's very easily missed in the text. Again, unless you're reading in an interlinear and look up that term, you basically never see it. 